Are you ready to step up your fabrication game in the garage? If so, come with me. Let's have some fun. So when you're playing with classic cars or race cars like my El Camino or even ATVs and stuff, there will come a time where you want to make something that doesn't necessarily exist or modify something to make it do what you want it to do. One of the first things that I would recommend getting to up your fabrication game, besides the welder and drill press because the hot metal glue gun is just fun, is a small bench top lathe. Let me show you what I just picked up. So I found this little machine shop, model 4100 High Torque. This is the High Torque model. They made a lot of these things. But the point is, is that this little guy is a good thing to step up to. Now, why would you go with a, a bench top model as opposed to a freestanding floor model? Purely because of space. This guy isn't huge. It doesn't have a huge footprint and still lets you make and modify a large number of things. Remember, most of the things that we do are two inches and under, and I do a lot of stuff, little bushings, modifying hardware that's all under an inch in diameter, and this little guy can do it. This has a seven inch swing and a 12 inch between center span, but clearly with the tailstock and the drill truck, I've got, oh, about six, seven inches there, but that's still plenty of room to do a huge number of things. Now the small bench top lathes, they get a bad reputation because people say, oh, they're junk, they're garbage, they're this, they're that. Well, the answer is, is they're not big enough to really have the torque to go through and hog off material like a big machine. So you kind of have to use them within their capacity. And that's really not so bad because most of what we're doing, we're trimming things up, facing something down to size, you know, cleaning up a diameter to make it fit better. Not all of that requires the super heavy duty lathe. These little ones can get you by. Now, if you're looking at used ones, keep in mind that there are people who use these things well beyond what they're capable of. And that is where they get broken. And that's why there's so many of these little things with broken half nuts and lead screws and parts and gearing on the back end and everything's just wore out. When you use them within their capacity, they actually work out pretty good. Now, if you're looking at one of these used, one of the best deals you can find is if you find one that's got tooling that goes with it, because you can lose your mind getting cutters and this and that and chucks and everything else. But if you find somebody who's selling it that's maybe made some upgrades, has some tooling that goes with it, that's probably the best way to go. Let me show you why I picked this one up specifically over so many others on the marketplace. So one of the reasons why this lathe in particular was so useful to me is it has the quick change tooling that lets you flip that lever and the tool block comes off and you're able to swap it off to different tools like this parting blade for an answer, for an example. You're able to lock it down and you're good to go. Now, a lot of times these will come with something like this. It's basically a four position selector that you're able to load up a handful of, of tools that you would normally use, typically two or three, just the way it works. And you're able just to spin it around to the tool you need. This works well for a lot of things. I've used one on a previous lathe and it worked great, only because it only performed a couple of functions. But the quick change tooling if you see this, it's something that is really handy to have. It allows you to have things set up so that way you can just stick them into place and they're good to go. And it also lets you do things like have a holder for a boring bar that you're able to put on the front and be able to bore inside diameters. Another thing that if you can find it, if you've got a, if you've come across one that's got tailstock tooling, uh, live centers have a center spindle that spins with a bearing around it so that way you're able to uh, support something long on both ends and turn the middle. Uh, the drill chuck is super useful so that way you're, you're able to drill diameters for example if you need to make a couple of interesting washers like that one that I just dropped but I have another one right here don't worry. You're able to make things like this to fit a very specific need. I dropped that one too. Gravity's working real well today. The other thing that's nice to have is a 45 degree or 90 degree, 90 degrees here, countersink. This lets you chamfer inside diameters like this little guy here. You can kind of see how there's a nice chamfer on the edge. That really cleans up your projects so that way things go together better. So what about cutters and stuff? Well, I found some stuff on Amazon for pretty reasonable money. It was a kit that came with you know, a couple of external cutters, inside diameter cutters, even came with an internal threading tool, which is something that I'm probably not going to do much of because I'm just not. But anyways, the point remains, 
in that oftentimes people who are selling these may have some tooling that goes with it. And if they don't, there is some reasonably priced stuff on Amazon that can handle the job. At least it's handled everything I've thrown at it so far, but I know that there's more to come on that one. So let me show you these cutters. The kit I bought includes a whole bunch of things, including like this turning tool. That little yellow piece, that's an indexable carbide cutter that allows you to turn it around when it gets dull. And this is a parting blade so that you're able to cut things off or cut grooves into things as you need them. Getting an indexable carbide cutter set like this was like 56 bucks on Amazon. And I'm surprised how well it's actually working out. Now, some of these little lathes come with plastic gears that handle the uh, gears for threading for the lead screw. There is oftentimes metal gear upgrades. This one's plastic, but online for like 125 bucks, you can get the metal gear set, which does improve the reliability and how well it cuts when you're doing things like threading. But just making sure that you have all the pieces, even if they are plastic and making sure that they're in good shape, that's an indicator that you're getting a machine that was well cared for. There's also another interesting little thing you can look for. Let me show you. Now this may seem counterintuitive, but when I'm looking for a machine, I don't want to see a perfectly clean machine. I want to be able to see that there's stuff in the chip pan. I want to know what's been cut. I've been cutting on aluminum, so there's aluminum everywhere. If you really look in the corners and underneath in the hard to clean areas, you'll be able to see potential uh, things as an indicator of what this lathe has been used for in the past. If you're seeing things that look way harder than aluminum, mild steel, some of the stainless is pretty tough and can actually be a little bit harder to cut on these machines because they just don't have the torque and capacity to do it. So be, don't be afraid to look in the corners, put your hand in there, brush the chips out and see what they are. You're pretty able to tell the difference between aluminum and steel but if you see stuff that looks way harder, that's an indicator. Keep that in mind. Okay, so we've talked about the machine itself, some of the tooling that you're going to want to get. And believe me, I'm going to put links in the description to some of the tools I just got for this that I'm very happy with and other things I like. When you're just getting started, something you're going to want to have is a pair of calipers. Whether your preference is digital or dial, it doesn't matter. This is a, a pair of Mitotoyo dial calipers that I've had for more than 20 years. They're still solid. They still zero out the way I want them to. And a nice thing is if you get ones that are dial, there's no battery to go bad. That's kind of why I like my dial calipers. Plus I can always see between the lines. And once you get familiar with your equipment, you're able to know how much plus or minus the line you are. Remember this goes out to thousands of an inch, but you can see everything between. And when you get comfortable with your equipment, you can get as close as a half a thousandth or five ten thousandths with one of these, just with your eyeball. Now, that's typically the realm of micrometers, and I'm probably gonna get some hate by people saying, oh, you can't measure half a thou of the caliper. I got 20 years experience. I'll bet you on that one. Anyways, so you don't have to step up and get micrometers right away. That is something you can grow into when you absolutely need the precision. The other thing you're gonna wanna get is a dial indicator and a magnetic base. This way, you're able to Stick the magnet to the ways and keep track of how much travel you have on the saddle going back and forth in and out. This lets you turn things to a shoulder. If you're facing something off, you're able to know that you can take, you know, 10,000s, 20,000s, whatever you're looking to do. The mag base makes it very easy to just reposition. Now, some of these things have a digital readout. Those are really nice, though not, not necessary they're nice to have. And if you've got one of the digital readout, that's killer. I've done a lot of manual machining with dial indicators every which way. I'm comfortable with it. So whatever you feel comfortable with, ultimately that's the direction you need to go. So you may be asking after talking about digital readout, how do you keep track of it? Well, you've got these graduations here and you can see that, you know, each line is equal to one thousandth of an inch, or if you're into metric, there's your number, but ultimately you need to you know, we're going to say that we're starting at the zero. You need to move in 10 thou right up to 10 and you're able to go through, make your cut, whatever you're doing, you're able to see it that way. Now the cross feed in and out or the Z as it's 
correctly known, doesn't have any graduations. That's where the dial indicator comes in. Now, this lathe doesn't have enough room on that side, so what I find I have to do is to set my indicator up. Hold on, I should have done this ahead of time, but I didn't. You're getting unscripted, Eric. And, of course, my tailstock's in the way. Let me get that clear so we can show you this nicely. Stay. So, you're able to see this right here is the dial indicator. Let's just pretend we're starting at the zero. You need to move 10 thou. You can just move it right like that. And you can make your cut if you're facing things off. It's really not that hard to use a dial indicator. It's just slightly more inconvenient when you've got things like tail stocks in the way or the enclosure itself doesn't allow it. Just keep that in mind when you're looking at these things. So you can see that the little lathes that are the benchtop models, they're an easy way to get into this to figure out, one, if it's something you want to do on your own or find people that can do it for you. They're also cheap enough that you're not spending a huge amount of money. I spent 800 bucks on that and I'm probably into it about another 100 for the tooling that I wanted, which includes the carbide cutter and the drill chuck. You know, a couple things here and there that I knew I wanted. Okay. So finding one for sale that's already tooled up, that can oftentimes save you money over buying new stuff and then buying all the new tooling that goes with it. So there will be more content coming on actually how that thing runs and things you can do with it. So thanks for watching, guys. We will catch you later. There will be more garage machining content coming.